get that set up on the table over here, and all the people know this is where they come for me. So that way, uh, that way you guys know. Um, that is the best news. So we'll get uh, we'll get our guys to finish getting that set up here in the next little bit, and we'll go from there. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.
Here's team money right here. Bobby A. Bear, here's team money.
Testing, testing. Uh, good morning. As we're waiting, I want to ask everyone to please uh, remember to put your cell phones on silent and or turn them off, please. Uh, good morning again. As we get started, we will have two microphones being passed around, wireless mics. Uh, if you could, when you ask your question, please address the coach and say your name and your affiliation loud enough because everything's being recorded. We're a little early. Hope you don't mind if you're tired. Okay. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started a little early. As people fill in, please feel free to have a seat. Uh, once again, good afternoon. I want to take this time to welcome everyone to the 2015 Women's College World Series here in Oklahoma City. Uh, this will be our first of two press conferences today. The second one will start about 3 o'clock p.m. Uh, from my right, your left, we have head coach Carol Hutchins from the University of Michigan, whose team advanced out of the Ann Arbor Super Regionals and comes into the Women's College World Series with an overall record of 56 and 6. Uh, the Wolverines are making their 11th appearance here in the College World Series. To her right, we have head coach Patrick, Mur Patrick Murphy from the University of Alabama, whose team advanced out of the Tuscaloosa Super Regionals. Uh, and comes into the World Series with an overall record of 47 and 13. Uh, the Crimson Tide are making their 10th appearance here in the College World Series. And next to him, we had Coach Mike White from the University of Oregon, whose team advanced to the Women's College World si Series out of the Eugene Super Regionals. They come into the Women's College World Series with an overall record of 51 and 6, and are making their fourth appearance here. And next to him, we have Head Coach Kelly Inouye Perez from the University of California, Los Angeles, uh, whose team advanced to the Women's College World Series out of the Los Angeles Regional. They come to Oklahoma with an overall record of 50 and 10, and their Bruins are making their 24th appearance here at the Women's College World Series. We'll open it up. Each coach will give general comments, and then we'll open up for questions. Coach Chucky. See, you have the oldest go first. Youngest, youngest coach. <laughs> First of all, it's uh, congrats to everybody, um, and uh, especially since the inception of Super Regionals, uh, it has made getting to Oklahoma City quite the prize because it is very difficult to advance and make it to the top eight, and it's a great credit to uh, the teams that make it here, but really it's a great credit to where our sport has gone, and I got a chance to... Uh, make the tournament uh, by Friday night and I got to sit back and watch all the Super Regionals and I gotta tell you, watching all those filled stadiums all across the country and the fantastic TV coverage is, um, you know, it's a dream come true for some of us who've been around a long time because this sport has gone through the, the roof. And it's a credit to, of course, the power of TV and it's a credit to uh, the institutional support that we've all received and uh, all the great coaches and student athletes in the game. So. Uh, Michigan is extremely excited to be back here in Oklahoma City. It's tough to get here. It's even tougher to win here. And, um, you know, I've got a great group. We're excited and ready to get going. Well, I want to say thanks to everyone, too. Uh, a gentleman from all of you took me around a little bit and showed me some of the uh, renovations. And the first time we were here, I think, was 2000. And this is just unbelievable. It, it reminds me a lot of Omaha, where they have done renovations year after year. And now Oklahoma <coughs> City is following in the footsteps of Omaha. And, um, there's not a better place to be. The stadium, the people, the media, everything is just, the, um, the coverage has doubled, tripled uh, since we started. And it is so much fun for us. Um, I apologize uh, to the Sooner fans because it was just a hell of a Super Regional with, with the OU. And, um, you know, we're just glad to get out of that Super Regional. Uh, I will echo what Coach Hutchins said. I don't think you could have said it any better. It's just so exciting right now to be in the sport uh, as a coach, as a team, um, and just see the spread of the, the wealth of talent across the country. It's not just the West Coast anymore. I know everyone's talking about SEC versus Pac-12, but as you can see, the Big 12, Big 10, or if you don't have to call Big 10 anymore, Big 14. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, that's big, yeah. But uh, all these conferences, ACC, I mean, there's it's just the softball is just getting better and better, and it's exciting for us all, uh, and not only as, as coaches, but student athletes. Um, and then, of course, the institutions. I know we're getting a new $16.5 million stadium. 
and we're hoping that's going to be the start of the build and the growth on the west coast. We hope to see the other institutions in the Pac-12 follow suit and really start to improve the facilities. And I want to thank our administration for the support in that. Um, you know, and, and I can't tell you how excited we are to be here right now. All eight seeds, first time since 2006, made it through. That's going to make for some really good, exciting softball. Um, you know, what all three of them said, but I'd like to also congratulate all the all the teams. I think we all, you know, start our seasons with the goal of being able to get to this point to be a top eight. Um, and it is a tough road. Um, been a part of this process for a while as a student athlete to assist into a head, and it is awesome to see the evolution of our sport. The evolution, the work, the time, the investment put into the stadium. You know, just got a mini walkthrough, and uh, it's awesome. Um, and I think a big part of that also is the ability to have the coverage on TV that has allowed um, you know us to get in those living rooms and have people really truly see how special this sport is. Um, but very fortunate, you know, I'm surrounded by some great coaches, some great teams. I'm uh, our team also. Uh, you know, we've been on a mission to get back here, and it's exciting to be back here. And uh, we just look forward to getting out here and playing some great softball. All right, we'll open up for questions. Raise your hand and one of your ladies will bring your mic. Tommy Dees, Tuscaloosa News. For uh, Carol and Patrick, can you talk about the, the meetings earlier this season, what you learned about each other and, and how your teams are different or better now? Well, that was a long time ago. And actually, you think about how long and what a grind our season is, and I would have thought it was last year. Um, but I've been able to uh, watch our team just evolve and keep evolving uh, from day one to whatever day we're in right now. And um, just like I know, I got a chance to watch Alabama. I uh, know they're on TV a lot. Um, and when we saw them early, I thought this is a team that's still trying to search for their new identity, their post-training identity. And, you know, they clearly have found it. And uh, they're gelling as a team. They're playing so well. And it's a credit to Patrick and what he does as a team every year. It's, it's the goal. It's from day one, we talk to our kids about just to be a little bit better every day. And I think we're a better team, and I'm certain that Alabama's a better team. Well, when we played, I think it was February 20th, um, the first thing that I thought of was this was her best offensive team. Because she comes from the cold and, and an insult, inside batting cage. I'm sure they weren't outside. And they hit the ball better than they <coughs> ever hit that early in the season against us. And that, that really impressed me. And they have two very good pitchers. Um, they obviously have one of the best players in the country at second base. Um, but it was it was a fun series. I know that we we are better. I'm sure they're better, which is kind of scary. Um, but we're looking forward to playing Michigan again. Uh, Lee Dobbins, uh, Justice World of Softball. Uh, this is Coach White. Coach, obviously, with the success that you've had, and I guess you could say a short period of time um, going from toward the bottom of the conference where Oregon has been in the past to the top one of the College World Series appearances. Obviously, you garner high praise throughout the country, and with that praise comes overtures from obviously different places. Could you comment on some of the rumors going around about the overtures, and uh, particularly with jobs at Oklahoma State and uh, Arkansas currently? Well, I, I think I'd say that rumors. I haven't been contacted by anybody, but um, you know, obviously, with a new stadium coming, I'm pretty happy where I'm at, and uh, you know, supporting the administration. Um, but you know, having said that, it is an economic thing for your family and everything else, so you have to listen. It doesn't mean you're going to move. But uh, I think you know, Patrick was, <laughs> you know, kind of one that did that. But uh, you know, <laughs> thanks, Patrick. Sorry. <laughs> you know, um, but, you know, it's it's part of the sport. Obviously, we all want, uh, you know, as head coaches, I'm sure we all want increasing salaries, and we all want to see more for our assistant coaches and for our programmers, facilities, and everything else as the growth of the sport. So as the growth of the sport grows, I think so we also have to be open, and hopefully our uh, administrations are open to that as well. Uh, Gary Leland with Fast Pitch TV. This weekend, one of this question's for everybody. Uh, I just like your thoughts. This weekend, one of the uh, pitchers were hit by a ball. And on our uh, forum, tons of people have been saying that they should wear face guards out there. I'd just like everybody's thoughts about that. We'll let Coach Hutchins go first and walk our way down. <laughs> I was watching that game. It's tragic. Um, and um, I think that they're allowed to wear them. Whether we mandate that, I don't know that we have enough data. We really need to take a look at the data and uh, see where we're at risk. 
because anytime you play any sport, especially with a ball and a bat, there's an assumed risk, and kids get hit. They get hit with pitches. They get hit. But is it happening at a rate that we need to mandate, like we've mandated helmets? And um, I think we shouldn't make an emotional reaction to somebody that gets hurt. And we certainly need to consider our student athletes' welfare. But um, you know, I've seen baseball pitchers get hit as well, and I've seen more baseball pitchers get hit than I've seen softball players get hit. And um, thank goodness, uh, you know, not not against baseball, of course. But uh, you know, it's something that that we just have to look at data. And uh, I think that we need a better system of collecting that data. I think there was a couple already in the SEC that are warning, but I think after watching that as well, you know, we have never said you can't wear it. And I think the pitchers probably assume that we don't want them to wear it. But I've never said that. And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them the option because I want them to feel safe. You know, I don't want them to think every time they throw a pitch they're going to be and so, you know, I'm going to sit down, I'll have four next year, and I'll say, if you want to wear one, it's fine with me. Uh, I'm in the same boat as Patrick here. I mean, there's a, there's a rumor out there that uh, travel coaches say that head coaches from D1 schools won't recruit a pitcher that wears a face mask. And I tell you, that's not true. Um, I, there's, in fact, I think we have one coming in next year, Megan Kleist, uh, committed to it or signed. So I can talk about it, but she wears a face mask. So I'm not going to tell her she can't wear it because who would feel worse if something happened? I couldn't live with myself. I told her to take that off, and she got hit. That's, that's not mine. Now, I didn't wear one. I didn't feel the need for it, but I can certainly see the need for it. You can see that in slow pitch softball, they're all wearing full batting home or full, ca full cages right now. Um, you know, hockey masks, basically. You know, they're so, so afraid of it. So if they're men and they're wearing helmets, you know, why shouldn't young women be able to wear helmets if they feel like, uh, or face masks, uh, if they feel threatened uh, by softball? I can echo what everyone has already said. Uh, the coach said you know, there was an, there's an assumed risk when you play any sport, um, and that's something that uh, should always be you know, taken into consideration to make sure we look out for the, the, the welfare of the student athlete. Um, but I do believe that there's a fine line on mandating things and also um, not telling someone that they can't. You know, I think there's, there's reasons for the mask, you know, most um, recently for the concussion, which once you get a concussion, there's a seriousness of being able to continue to play and being at risk to further the, the injury. Um, you know, I see some, some teens, my, my daughter, she's only 10, they've mandated that everybody get by to practice, everybody in the infield wear a mask. And, you know, I'm not necessarily saying that that is something that I'd like for to be a message in our sport. Um, but I do believe there's a safety issue that we have to consider and it's usually injury based. So, and ultimately, as we've all said, it is a student athlete's choice to be able to be in that situation and that's ultimately um, probably the bottom line. Uh, Cliff Brown, Associated Press. Uh, this could be for any of you. Uh, back when the softball was taken out of the Olympics, I think there might have been some concern about the future of the sport. It was strong in a lot of ways, but it's maybe some concern about the, the way it might be perceived, visibility. Uh, but you guys have all said it's very, very strong. Are you surprised in any way that it's continued to grow in spite of that? We'll let Coach uh, Ian Wick Perez talk about that one. Um, you know, well, I think there's always concern if you don't have the ability to have a, you know, your team as an Olympic sport um, because that is ultimately a, the, the pinnacle of other sport to be able to wear the red, white, and blue in the Olympics. You know, we still do have a national team, and I think the national team is a great job of being able to get the best athletes to be able to compete on the national level. Um, but college has become the stage, and TV has allowed us to be able to continue to grow the viewer, the viewership, to be able to have uh, people watch the road to the World Series. So it's become our biggest stage, and we do celebrate the, con the continued increased numbers um, that of uh, viewership that we see every year. The College World Series. I mean, they've had to expand the stadium. They've had to, you know, they brag about the numbers. So I think that's something that we're proud of. I think at the grassroots level, I truly believe we we are a sport that needs to make sure that we continue to get those grassroots kids into the sport. And a big part of that is getting us. You know, ultimately back to that Olympics, that Olympic stage, because you know that's something that all kids have a dream to be able to strive for. But for right now, <coughs> college is the stage. Getting that, getting that opportunity to get a discount or get a scholarship and then represent your school and be on TV is, is a big dream. And uh, you know, all of us here know that out there in recruiting, that's what kids are really trying to get after. So for right now, it is the biggest stage, and we celebrate that. Myron Patch, Fox Twenty Five, uh, and this could be. For any of you, I mean, Patrick, you, Alabama won in 2012. Let's, this kind of gets to experience. How important is the experience factor playing in this event? 
uh, just the format and everything else. And I mean, you may have some weather, you may have some rain outs or rain delays, and just kind of dealing with that whole thing. Is experience important dealing with that, or is that overplay? Coach Murphy. I, we had a little team meeting uh, before we left, and one of our seniors said, we, we're very experienced. The only class that hasn't been here is the freshman class. And there's a lot of different things that go on at the World Series that don't go on during the regular season. And I think everybody is kind of used to you guys, um, the facility, the fans, everything that goes along with it. So I'm hoping that it works in our advantage because it is very different from an everyday game in Alabama. Coach, do you want to address the question? You know, I've been out here with teams that came back to back to back to back, and um, they didn't always win a lot of games. And uh, we came here in 05 after we had our hearts broken in 04, and uh, I thought it gave us a fantastic edge. I really think a lot of it has to do with the, the makeup of your group. But we do um, to try to stay on task with what we've done all year. And we do have media. We do have great facilities and great fans. So it's a little more normal than it was back when uh, I played on what was uh, virtually a high school field. Uh, the year we won the championship, our high school field near my house was nicer than the softball field we played at uh, in Michigan. So I think our kids are used to playing on the big stage and TV and ESPN. Uh, but ultimately, we're just playing the game of softball. Nothing changes. Barry Trammell with the Oklahoma. Kelly, 10, 15 years ago, this tournament, this field was dominated by the by the Pac-10, now Pac-12. You talk about the softball wealth is spread across the nation, but it's become tilted. Now the SEC is doing to this field what, what you guys used to do in the Pac-12. Why did that occur? What's happening down south or is not happening out west anymore? Why did that occur? Um, I think I don't necessarily have a reason on why you know, the SEC is represented more here at the series. We just know anything can happen now with the format, which I think is outstanding. But what I do believe is very true is the sport is in an, uh, a great place. You see it is, as Coach White said, it's no longer just West Coast dominated. We are, we are coast to coast. We have outstanding athletes all over the country. Um, we have outstanding coaches that are doing a great job of being able to teach the fundamentals and teach these girls how to be the best they can be from coast to coast. The schools and administrations are backing their programs and have made, you know, the SEC and, and, and other conferences, but um, have made a strong stand with their facilities, with their salaries, with their ability to make a stand in the sport, and I think it's been great for our sport. Um, so I don't know if tilt is the word, but I think our ability to expand and, and truly have excellence from coast to coast is something that we're, we're seeing right now, um, and, and I celebrate that. I really do. Uh, Jason Kersey from the Oklahoma and Patrick, uh, going into her, I guess, last at bat in the Super Regional, Marissa was 0 for 8, um, really stepped up and, and made that huge play that obviously sent you here. Did you get the sense that she was due for that, or were you were you concerned about her slump, and, and how much confidence has that given her moving into this? I wasn't concerned at all, because she's one of the, the easiest going kids we've ever had. Her demeanor is perfect to be a hitter. You would not you would not be able to tell by looking at her body language that she's 0 for 4 or 4 for 4. I mean, I think it is perfect for the game of softball, baseball player. Um, I wasn't, I think everybody, it just seemed like it was going to be fate because I had pinch hit four the time before. And, you know, the ball's going to find you. And then uh, Nay Hayes gets hit by a pitch with two outs, and guess who's up? The kid that's over. And I went up and down the, the dugout and said, this is fate, this is fate. You know, she's going to do something here. And I think the entire dugout believed in her. Uh, I didn't think it was going to happen on the first pitch, but <laughs> she liked the first pitch. And um, she's just a very resilient, gritty kid. Yeah, Pat Billy Gainesville, son Carol, can you talk about, I mean, since you've been around the sport and saw the SEC and what it's been able to do to go from five teams through 2004 here and now 28 in the last uh, 11 years, and, and this obviously the five this year. What you've seen uh, from afar, and, and Patrick, can you add, seeing it up close, what you think the reason is why it has increased so much? Well, I, I don't remember what year it was, but we um, went down to play in, uh, in our spring trip. We stopped in Tuscaloosa, and they hadn't built that magnificent facility yet. Patrick was the assistant coach. 97. So that was 97. And um, see, this is Team 38 at Michigan. I believe this is Team 19. So 
So the SEC didn't even have softball. They didn't sponsor it. And I think in Florida, the schools were playing some slow pitch. And like any great institutions and great conferences, they decided that they wanted to have softball. And they didn't just want to have it. They wanted to be good at it and give the SEC credit because they have supported them in the areas that matter, which is facilities and coaching and support staff for their student athletes. And they've done it the right way. And there's talent. There's more talent than ever. There's more youth ball than ever. There's more dreams for young kids because this going to college and playing softball is their dream. Um, and there's a lot of great kids, and the SEC has done a fantastic job with it. And um, you have to give them credit. I just think a lot of the schools and the administrators do not like status quo. And when they see somebody do well, they're going to go back and they're going to say, "Wait a minute, we got to do that." And I think it's just evolve from there and you can see how many either coaching changes facility changes upgrades um, it's just like any sport in the SEC now you know you, you know if somebody wins in football somebody else is going to try to win next year and I think it's evolved to the sport of softball and I think it's a very good thing because if you think you've um, reached that point you're going to get run over the next year and it's just like in the Big Ten and the Pac-12 if somebody does really well, everybody else is going to try to catch up, and I think that's happening in, in the SEC. Yeah, quick run. Associated Press, this is for Oregon and UCLA. Just your thoughts on playing again, uh, such a familiar opponent to go through so much, and then end up matched up again. Well, you don't pick your opponent, you know, so it comes from a draw, but um, obviously UCLA, and it, it's been, it was a great series. I mean, obviously it came down to one pivotal game, it could have gone either way, and we were fortunate come ahead of that game and the next day, you know, it happened what happened, but uh, I don't think it's going to mean anything for the next game. It's going to kind of be a knockdown, drag out game. Um, you know, I'm sure they're prepared for us, we're prepared for them, and uh, it's exciting. I mean, even any one of these coaches will tell you, if you want to win this championship, you're going to beat a good team, you know, well, several good teams, and this is just the first game. So, um, obviously, I hope we're going to be on top, but uh, it could happen either way, and if it doesn't, we'd be prepared for the next game, but uh, we're excited to play UCLA. I echo that. I think, uh, as he stated, our series was exciting. It was a, you know, as both of us were striving for that Pac-12 championship, uh, you know, we had a decisive win. They had a decisive win, and you know, that middle game uh, could have gone either way. It was the prettiest game, but um, so I, I look at this as a great opportunity for us to be able to kind of get back out there. We are familiar. We're very prepared, but we're in a new season, um, so everything, you know, it's fortunate. Coach Wooden did share it very simply yesterday. He was old as dirt, and we have no control over tomorrow. So we're right, we're living right now, and we're going to get out there and have a great practice, and then. Get up and play great softball tomorrow. Yeah, Mike Barry Trammell with the Oklahoma. We talk about facilities here, and you mentioned it earlier. You know, your new stadium. You hope that spurs more uh, more construction on the West Coast. Have Pac-12 facilities in general fallen behind the curve? Well, you know, of course, a lot of it comes down to what generates the revenue to build them. You know, it's football money, obviously, a lot of. But we had a, a, a great uh, sponsor stand up, Mr. Sanders. Uh, so separate from all football money and everything else, we've found our own sponsor, and that's uh, Herb Yakamana that got that done, a, a big fundraiser for us. But you know, hopefully it does lead into, you know, like Patrick said, this competition. You know, now Oregon has this. We hope it spurs the other schools to do something like Cal uh, obviously needs an upgrade. Um, UCLA could do with some new facilities. And, and, it, and you see a little bits and pieces like ASU or Arizona has a new batting format out there. You're seeing bits of pieces. But I'd really love to see some of these new stadiums get as glitzy as the SEC and, and some of the Big 12 and Big, uh, Big 10. Ryan Aper from the Oklahoma. And, uh, Patrick, you touched on it a little bit earlier, knocking off Oklahoma and, and uh, having them not here. And it's been a while since Oklahoma hasn't been here. Uh, for each of the four of y'all, make your case for why the local fans, the the fans who typically come out here and cheer for OU should cheer for your team. Same colors. <laughs> uh, when, I, when, I, when I saw a couple of Oklahoma people at our game, I almost said roll tide because I didn't see the rest of their shirt. And I was like, oh, boomer. <laughs> you know, I came to the football game here when we did home and away, and I did it probably 10 times. And they just kind of waved at me. They didn't know what to say. So um, they can cheer for everybody. I mean, they're great. It's very knowledgeable fans here. That's what's so cool about it. Everybody knows a good play, a good player, when a big time is in the game, and um, the crowd is just awesome here. Coach White. 
Oh, I'm. <laughs> 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 well, we just excited to play in front of ten thousand fans. That's what we're excited to do. And uh, you know, I said this to my to my team is that you know I played in plenty of stadiums where we didn't have anybody watching. I'll tell you what I'd rather have. Um, and, and we play it like no one's cheering against you. Everyone's cheering for you. They want to see good softball, and, and that's what we're coming prepared to play is good softball. That's great. I agree. I think you know the Oklahoma fans want to see great softball, you know, and, I, and uh, the the series is going to, I think, truly allow us to be able to do exactly that. Um, but if you want a little inside scoop on why they should be cheering for us, um, we have a brew in the team age to Patty Sun, so I don't know. That might be a little bit <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Andrea Harrison. Okay. Wow. I got it. Think they would cheer against the Patrick and those Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> but I've seen uh, the, the fans here. They do. They they just cheer for great softball. But when they do tend to get behind a team, it's they, the Cinderella team that steps up. Maybe the team that the very first year we ever came, Iowa came as well, and they were unseeded. And man, they came in third in the tournament. They just they were the Cinderella team, and that was the team everybody picked up on. And, uh, you know, the top eight seeds are here, so I don't know who the underdog and who the Cinderellas are. In my case, I, don't know, I always feel like we're the underdog, so uh, they can cheer for us. I just, I just hope that uh, Oklahoma forgives us for that football game up in. Uh, <laughs> 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 I was at that game, and that was a bad call. <laughs> uh, for uh, Carol and Patrick, you know, Carol, you talked about the time you came to Alabama. I think in their first season, I mean, maybe the second home game Alabama had at a public park. You two obviously have known each other for a long time. What do you see in the, in the other that you most admire in, in, as a coach? Well, I always say Patrick guys in the game. And um, I've watched him with his student athletes. And uh, those kids, it's hard to uh, play Alabama because I like them so much. I like their kids. I like the way they represent the sport. They always say thank you. They're always really reverent. I mean, we've gone down to Alabama a number of times. Actually, he owes me a trip. And um, we played this year, and we played, and we happened to win both those games. And afterwards, Danae Hayes came up to me and said, thanks, it was an honor to play you. I mean, it's hard to dislike kids like that. They are just always classy. And that starts at the top. And he teaches to respect the game. And uh, they play for the big A on the front of their shirt. And, um, they're, they're my kind of team. And for me, I mean, I like you said, I've known her since 1997, and maybe even before that. You played in our field in 93 when you were the assistant at Southwestern and you can do that. Okay. <laughs> we'll probably back, but uh, <laughs> the same goes for me with her and her teams. Um, you know, I try to be like her. I mean, everybody loves her. Um, she always wins in the cold and the snow. I'm from Iowa. I respect that. Um, you know, I love her staff. Just really, really good people. And that's what we try to emulate. We try to do the same thing that she's doing. And she's done it for years. And she's got like 1,500 wins. I mean, it's unbelievable. And we tried to go there in 2013, and it didn't work out. So I will go. Deal. You're going to have to swear more if you want to be like that. <laughs> Kyle Fredericks with the Oklahoma. Uh, question for Carol. Uh, there's a bit of a local tie with, with your star, Sierra Romero, being that her younger sister uh, went and uh, signed on at OU. Uh, just for bringing that up. <laughs> well, just, just with that local tie, just wanted to maybe get your thoughts on, on her as a player and, and what that recruitment process was like. Uh, that, that being Sydney. You want me to comment on Sydney? Is that what your question is? Yeah, just to, with, with the local pick. Well, maybe Patty will root for us. <laughs> I saw Sierra Romero walk up to Patty Castle last night at the function, and I don't know what the conversation was, but um, you know, I, I have to say, people ask about Sierra Romero all the time. She's clearly one of the greatest in the game, and what I always say about her is what I like best about her is she's humble, and she was raised really well. This is a kid who understands what no means. This is a kid who respects authority and respects her coaches and respects her team. Um, and I'm certain, um, you know, we, we did try to get Sydney to come to Michigan, and honestly, I don't know why she didn't choose us. But um, I'm certain that Sydney, too, will be a great player because she comes from a great gene pool, all those Romero's. I mean, uh, you meet Michael, the youngest son. I don't, can I comment on him? He's, he's a fantastic athlete, and uh, but they were raised well. 
and I think that's a really important quality in uh, these kids. Jason Garza with the Oklahoma. Patrick, uh, when you guys won it, uh, I guess three years ago, and your seniors were freshmen, uh, in, in that game three, you guys were losing, I think, going into the weather delay. Um, but looking back on that, what about that weather delay allowed you guys to come out of it so forcefully the way you did? And considering there could be some weather this week, is that something you guys can draw on at all? Possibly. I mean, we, we've had bad weather all spring. We, I mean, out of our eight SEC weekends, only two was it uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We either got a doubleheader Friday, doubleheader Saturday, or a single Saturday and doubleheader Sunday. I mean, everybody had to deal with the bad weather, I think everywhere. So, um, but that, that, um, that game and that time, it was just unbelievable. And I think that break was perfect for us. Our crowd got involved. Our dugout was the main reason why we won that game, though, because they charged out of the dugout. The people that weren't playing, they were ready to go. They were ready to do anything and everything they could to win that game. And I think they willed everybody else, especially the next four hitters, to get hits. Um, and that was, you know, for us, it was a once in a lifetime deal with everything was going wrong. And then all of a sudden, it turned the opposite way. And I, I, I'm not sure if it'll help us this year, but um, I think everybody's used to weather delays um, because this was one of the worst springs ever in the South. We're, I'm sorry, were some of those players that uh, were on the bench that you said were so helpful, were they the younger players, the freshmen that might be oh, yeah, seniors now? Definitely. Like some of those? Because really the only one that played was Danae Hayes. Yeah. So the other four, they were role players that year. And they bought in immediately. Kyle Fredericks with the Oklahoma. A question for Kelly. You had all had the discussion about wearing face masks for the, to protect the pitchers. Obviously, you were there to, to see this latest incident happen. When it does happen as a coach, what goes through your mind uh, when you see the ball come off the bat and, and like, like it did? Oh, it was, it was uh, very, very scary. I think uh, we immediately, all of us, kind of rushed the mound, even if it wasn't our player, because uh, uh, you know she went down and, and clearly was in pain. So, you know, my first memory of it was when she went down you know the crowd went silent because it was it was very loud and uh lisa my assistant you know ran uh literally ran straight to the training room and grabbed the bag of ice and kirk went straight you know to the circle almost got there just as quick as their trainer did so um, i have a pretty clear picture that we all circled there pretty quickly and then kind of pulled everyone back and then uh i actually went to my player who hit the ball and um she was in tears you know she just she's like i, I you know, she had almost hit her the at bat before she she had hit a ball that went right by her, and she said, Coach, I almost hit her. And then for that to happen, she, she emotionally, as a freshman, just you know, lost it. So I kind of went to her to console her, um, but it went from a very, very loud, rocking atmosphere <coughs> to complete silence. Um, and it took, it took some time for us to be able to all take in what happened. When they took her off the field, you know, we got to see you know, true sportsmanship. I think everyone gave her a standing O, and we all consoled the players and the coaches, and we you know, went back out there and got back after the softball game. But, uh, Part of the game. It was a very, very, very scary time. Yeah, Patrick Barry Trammell with the Oklahoma. <clears throat> Apologize in advance, but Mike opened the door. We have a coach in town who now who took a job and then changed his mind a few days later. <laughs> Billy Donovan. My question to you is, how tough is that when when you go back to the job that you had and uh, still a great job, still doing a great job? But what kind of transition did you have to make just that first week or two or ever how long and Obviously, you got the program back to where it was, or no missteps, but how tough was that on you, and what kind of things did you have to go through? Well, you have to mend some fences, first of all, and basically that's with administrators, your boss, uh, the fans. I think the girls were relieved, the players, but it was uh, the outside people that didn't understand, and you know that's, that's the people that, um, 4,000 people that came to the game against OU on Sunday afternoon. I mean, that was the... Those people, they mean a lot to me too. So it was the fans, the administrators. Um, spent a lot of time with the media. But then, back to normal. All right, we have time for one final question. Jason Kersey from the Oklahoma. Kelly, to follow up on Kyle's question, you said that your player was in tears about that and how difficult that was. How, how tough is that moving forward for a player who experiences something like that from, from the side of the person who actually hits the ball? And, and how much can that linger? Are you speaking about my player? Or yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you know what? The That girl is, um, I don't worry about her. It kind of showed, I believe she's just, you know, very well-rounded. It's just um, a young 
kind of competitive athlete, but also has that real side of her. She's a real sweet girl, yet she's a very fierce competitor. So in that moment, oh yeah, you know, she stopped the game and it was very scary. Um, but how she responds, I, I believe she's going to get back out there because she's a she's a true competitor. You know, she loves to compete, loves the game, and um, you know, so we respectfully she went over and she even, you know, had a moment to be able to talk to the coaches and the players, and that's what we do. And then she went back out there and got back after it again. All right, coaches, we want to thank you for your time. Wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Our next press conference starts at 3 p.m. sharp.